Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. As I was mentioning before we started the recording, we've got a, a wonderful group here from just every sector <laughs> in tech, I think, and that's pretty darn cool. Um, before we get started, it looks like we do have, we already have a question. Ted, yeah, did you want to? I'm terrible. I can't stick around for this, but I'm very interested in this presentation. It uh, will be, re it is being recorded and I will share that publicly. Great. Thank you. Uh huh. See you next time. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. All right. Um, so while uh, I was at a one of one of the recent spring conferences, uh, I was doing an ask me anything about uh, what's happening in the browser land and how it's impacting Federation. And a lot of people were particularly curious about, um, OK, so that's the big picture, but how are how is this actually being implemented? What are people actually doing? And so uh, I wanted to pull together a webinar of people who are actually doing some of the implementation of one of the APIs that we're particularly interested in, which is the Federated Credential Management API. Um, so today we have Aaron Parecki from Okta and Phil Smart from JISC, two of the people who have actually implemented FedCM uh, just to, to make sure it works as as we all hope and intend. Um, this is being done, uh, this webinar is being done under the auspices of ID Pro because that's this is kind of what we do. Uh, we're very interested in what's happening in the identity space and making sure that practitioners have a safe place to just talk about what it's like being in the industry from lots of different perspectives. Obviously today the perspective is primarily what's it what's it like about uh, working in the standard space. Um, but we do a lot more than that. So if you're not a member, you're welcome to join. Here, obligatory, uh, obligatory sales pitch over. Um, so yeah, today we're talking specifically about the imp implementation of the Fer uh, Federated Credential Management API. So uh, there's a link to the draft specification uh, and to, to bring folks up to speed who aren't embedded in the standard space. Um, this API is uh, being developed within the W3C. And as such, it started its incubation life in a community group. Now, community groups don't actually get to create standards. They're basically, they're literally the place to just incubate the idea to see, is this going to fly? Is this going to have traction? Is this something that's actually works and as intended and will it be adopted? You know, could it be adopted? Once we've reached a certain level of stability, then uh, for it to actually become a W3C recommendation, a standard that's coming out of the W3C, it has to move into a working group. Now, the Federated Identity Working Group actually has just formed this year, and so uh, FedCM is is on its way. Is some of that, some aspects of it are still being developed. Um, some of it uh, is actually more mature and ready to move closer to standardization. So what is it? It's, uh, as it says in the spec, it's a web platform API that's going to uh, basically take take over some of the um, privacy considerations from the user perspective, making sure that the user knows exactly what's happening when they click the login or sign in button. Um, if you, if it, if you haven't, heard anything about FedCM before, then you probably want to go uh, look at that spec a little bit to help some of this make sense. But I'm going to assume based on uh, how many people I recognize in the attendee list, you do have some some familiarity of what FedCM uh, is intended to do. So I'm going to just now go straight over to why we're all really here, which is to actually talk about the implementation and how that's being done. So I'm going to hand over to Phil. I think that's who we wanted to start with. Phil, mm -hmm. it's all you. Okay. Thank you, Heather. Uh, so hopefully you can see that. Um, I have no idea how to control PowerPoint like this, so I'm just going to use this kind of mechanism. Uh, so I'm going to try and demonstrate some FedCM experiments that I've been doing with the Shibboleth IDP. I do work two days a week for the Shibboleth Consortium on the Shibboleth project, so I have some obviously experience with the IDP. Um, I'm going to put out a few disclaimers, I have to say, to start with. This is an experiment, um, and there are several experimental features of FedCM itself that are being used, and there are other features of FedCM that I may have overlooked. So there's plenty of development in the FedCM space. Uh, it's evolving quite quickly. So 
I'm sure there are things which I may not have picked up on. Um, the approach has not been validated in any way. Security considerations, internal scrutiny, it's not a production ready thing. This And there's not an attempt here to produce a sample binding or profile. This is very experimental um, in nature. Uh, I work for JISC as well. So JISC um, uh, uh, support the UK Federation at UK Access Management Federation, which is a research and education federation. There's many different federations across the world. This is just a bit of context. Uh, we trust federations. We support cross-domain federated identity and single sign-on for library services, research collaborations, student verification, teaching and learning. Um, over 27 million um, kind of uh, use, uh, 27 million students, researchers, and education uh, educators. I'll start again. Educators uh, access online services this way. Um, and we are currently kind of SAML based. So we currently operate like a SAML based federation. Uh, we are a large scale federation, and there is an inter federation service known as EduGain, which currently consists of around 5,680 IDPs and nearly 3,719 RPs or service providers. Uh, they use a different variety of different software. Uh, Shibboleth is one of them. There's others. Uh, other favorite IDPs are available. Simple Sample, PHP, Open Athens, Microsoft. There are more. Uh, there are some stats on the Educain website if you wanted to have a look at those. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on this. Obviously, FedCM itself um, presents some new requirements for an IDP, new endpoints, new logic. When we go through the demonstration, you will see some of this um, in use. So I'm not going to spend too long on that. Uh, the RP, again, has to change, so there need to be changes to the relying party. They need to move away from the existing kind of session uh, authentication initiation mechanisms they have over to this FedCM kind of JavaScript set of uh, API, uh, navigator.credentials.get in this case. Um, and just to note that this all happens on the RP, so this isn't something that you can do in an IDP-initiated way. So you cannot, from the IDP, initiate a kind of unsolicited authentication request to the RP through FedCM. And that is a, a use case which is quite common in uh, at least research and education. Uh, I am using three experimental, I believe still experimental. I think we've got a couple of browser guys on, so maybe they'll tell me they're not, but um, three experimental FedCM APIs, the parameters API, the continuation API, and the IDP sign-in status API. Without those APIs, um, I wouldn't be able to show um, this demonstration in the way that I'm going to show it today. So as a thumbs up, I think that's good news for what I'm saying. Okay, so I'm going to switch this to a... Um, Stop sharing that. No, I did not stop sharing that. Did I? Still sharing it. It's still sharing that. Stop. There we go. So now I'm going to share a very wide video. So hopefully this is going to work. Um, so I've got the slides on the left and the video on the right, and I'm not uh, particularly uh, gifted at producing videos. So hopefully this is going to work. Uh, so on the right, we've got a relying party. This is a um, demonstration relying party. This is just one that I've developed to support FedCM. Uh, and we are going to pretend uh, that we're going to want to access some particularly protected resource on this relying party. Um, so some service uh, on the relying party. So the first thing we want to do, so obviously we've navigated to the RP, and the first thing we want to do is actually who is the identity provider we want to use. Now, FedCM has two kind of modes of operation. It has this widget mode uh, and it has this button mode. In the widget mode, it would kind of load on page load typically. So when you got to the RP, it would load an account selector slash IDP selector. Um, in the button mode, you need kind of some user initiation of the of FedCM. So you'd need a button you'd press to initiate uh, the FedCM API. Um, the widget mode does support multiple IDPs experimentally. And if you remember from the start, I said that Edugain, you know, in Edugain, we have about 5,700 IDPs. So we need a way to select between 5,700 of these IDPs. Uh, so the widget mode does have experimental support for multi IDPs, but it would only show you IDPs that you've actually already logged into. That is, an ongoing conversation um, about how that is working and how my or my perception of how that works. Uh, but for now, if I'm not logged into an IDP, I won't be able to see it through the widget mode, through the multi-IDP mode. Uh, so I've switched to the button mode. So the button mode does allow you to select an IDP that you've not already signed into, uh, but the button mode doesn't support multiple IDPs. And presumably if it did, it would have a similar problem to the widget mode for multi-IDP support, but you know this is all being developed. 
And so because I couldn't use the multi-IDP support, or there is no multi-IDP support that is um, suitable for the selection of such a large scale number of IDPs, I've used seamless access. So seamless access is a service uh, that uses a, a SAML identity provider discovery service protocol. And what's going to happen is I'm going to redirect to this central discovery service, seamless access. I'm going to choose an IDP. It's going to redirect me back to the RP and with that choice that I've made. So if I if this video works, let's see. So I'm going to click on access through your institution. So I'm going to start typing JISC. If I type J, you'll see it's got 209 matches already. So, you know, we are operating at a very large scale here. This isn't typically your seven kind of IDP problem. So I'm going to get to JISC. So I've selected JISC. So what's happened there is if I roll on, there we go. So Seamless Access has responded to my RP with the unique identifier of the IDP I've selected. And so the RP is now able to form, well, firstly, a SAML request, okay? So this is me experimenting with how you would fit SAML into this flow. So it's gonna create a SAML authentication request, which is appropriate for the IDP, the FedCM JISC IDP that I've selected. And in this case, it's also gonna request multi-factor authentication. So it's created, first step is created a SAML request. And then if I roll it on, it then says, okay, so I'm now going to embed this uh, the SAML request. Uh, and I'm sure a bit like Aaron's going to do for OpenID a little bit later on. I'm going to embed this SAML request inside of a FedCM request. And it has to do that inside these experimental params field, um, because uh, which I, I believe is still experimental in the way that this wouldn't work um, uh, currently in the in the I'm going to say the live version. That is not the right way to say it, uh, but it requires this parameters API. So I've embedded the SAML request, base64 encoded uh, inside the um, FedCM providers configuration, a provider configuration. Now I'm going to actually initiate FedCM. So, sorry, I'm not going to do that, of course. Um, this is what the RP then calls. So this is the uh, configuration object that it's going to send into the navigator.credentials.get JavaScript API, FedCM JavaScript API on the ID, uh, on the RP's page. Again, the SAML request, I've just sort of blanked out. The SAML request would be that full request we just saw on the previous slide. Uh, so this is what a um, way is. This is the initiation process, if you like, for FedCM. So when I do that, FedCM is going to immediately go and retrieve the IDP's well-known file. So the well-known file is a way to determine a trustworthy location uh, of the IDP's configuration file. Uh, now, the well-known file has to be at the IDP's ETLD plus one. So it has to be at org.edu.wellknown forward slash web identity. It cannot reside at idp.org.edu.wellknown um, uh, forward slash web identity, which could add some additional level of administrative burden, could be very difficult to kind of manage that or somebody else may be managing that. Uh, now, I believe if you use the registration API that this, this requirement may go away or there may be some progress towards changing this. But for now, the well-known file that it's going to immediately go and retrieve from the JISC IDP in this case, because that's who I've selected, has to be at um, that particular location. If I scroll it on. Then what it's going to do, oh, I believe it does this in parallel technically, but then what it's going to do is go and fetch the IDP's configuration file. So the previous, the well-known file lists where the IDP's configuration file is, and that has to match the configuration file that you specified in the configuration object that you've um, passed into FedCM. So it now goes to fetch the IDP's config file. The IDP config file is a, essentially a piece of metadata which lists the account send point, the client metadata endpoint, the ID assertion endpoint, the login URL, and some branding information. With that knowledge, FedCM is then going to make a request to the user or the accounts endpoint. Now, in this case, it's going to make that uh, request to the accounts endpoint with cookies. All previous requests to the IDP uh, for the uh, well-known file and for the config file are without cookies, without knowledge of the RP. In this case, it's going to make a request to the IDP with cookies, so it's a credentialed request. Um, with some security headers. Uh, it's not going to reveal anything about the RP at this stage. So it's going to say, pass me some accounts which are related to this cookie in effect. Um, now, in the demo IDP that I've currently got responding, it's only going to respond with a 
placeholder. We'll see that in a second. Uh, and it's only going to respond with a placeholder which says, yes, the user does have an active session with this IDP. It's not going to send back the email address, full name, uh, given name, and various other um, kind of personally identifiable pieces of information. Uh, it's not very common in r &E federations, at least to release like email address and things like that. And this happens before the user consents. So in the consumer space, maybe that works, but I think it would be a conversation to have about how well that would work in, uh, at least for our, in our case, in r &E. um, But immediately, it's actually going to send back an empty accounts list. And it's going to send back an NP accounts list because the user who went to this RP has never logged into an IDP or their IDP before, or in my case, the JISC IDP. So it's going to send back an empty list, and that's going to trigger FedCM into saying, okay, you need to actually authenticate or sign into your IDP. So now it's going to present a login page in a pop-up window. So it's going to make a pop-up window. I was going to sorry initiate a pop-up window with the login page for the IDP. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually authenticate to the IDP. Now, importantly, I'm authenticating here directly to the IDP. I have no knowledge, or the IDP has no knowledge at this stage of who the RP is. So you're not actually signing into the RP yet. You're just authenticating to the IDP. So in this case, I'm going to authenticate with the username and password, and only a username and password. When I do that, and if the authentication is successful, the IDP is going to create me a single sign-on session related to the cookie, effectively. Um, and then it's going to call two JavaScript APIs as part of an intermediary HTML page, which you can't see in this case. It happens so quickly. Uh, the first is to set my login status to logged in. So that tells the browser or the browser record state about uh, the fact that I've logged into my IDP. And the second is it's going to call the identity provider.close method, which actually then returns control back to the Fed, back to FedCM on the RP. So it's going to, I'm going to authenticate, create a session, and then call those two APIs. And then it's going to go back to FedCM on the RP. FedCM on the RP calls the account endpoint again. And in this case, it's going to actually return this placeholder account because in this case, it knows the IDP knows I have a session, but at least for now, in this demonstration, it's not willing to release anything about my session. It's just saying you have a session. This is the placeholder. This is a JISC account. Do you want to log in with your JISC account? Again, in consumer stuff, and I think what Aaron will show, Aaron will show is going to be a bit more involved in this in this case. But in this, for us, it's just at the moment a placeholder account. Um, it's It shows up, as you can see on the right, and it says, do you want to sign in with JISC account? Now, this should be an account. This is you know a different kind of um, model, interaction model, really, for this at the moment. So I'm now going to click to, I want to actually sign in. So at this point, FedCM is going to call the assertion endpoint to mint me a token. Now, it does this as a post request. It's credentialed. It sends the IDP cookies. Um, and now it will send the RP's origin in the origin header as well as some additional security headers, uh, but it will not follow redirects. So this is kind of like a non-browser flow. So it's sending a request to the IDP's uh, new FedCM assertion endpoint that says, mint me a token. Um, it's going to also send the SAML request. It says, mint me a token based on this authentication request. Um, and here's your IDP cookies, and it's going to do it uh, as a post request, but it doesn't at this stage have any sort of browser support. There's no pop-up window. Um, this is all happening and it has to be it's like a synchronous binding if you like it has to the idp has to immediately respond to this http request that fedcm is making presumably through something like the fetch api hello i'm not an expert on that browser side of it so it's going to do that it's going to go to the assertions endpoint uh, when it, the idp receives the authentication request it's actually going to decode the incoming uh, fedcm request uh, using a made up binding like i say i'm not trying to create a binding as such. I'm just trying to experiment with this. Uh, it's a SAML binding. It's a bit like the HTTP POST binding because the SAML request is coming through in the HTTP POST uh, method, uh, sorry, in the HTTP POST parameters. Uh, the IDP is going to do its usual security checks. The IDP is also going to check whether it trusts that RP based on federation metadata that it's got uh, on, you know, in the, on the server side. Um, then it's going to say, does this user have an active single sign-on session or authentication result? capable of satisfying this authentication request. Now, if you remember, I asked for MFA. So I, the RP was requiring multi-factor authentication, but I only actually signed into the IDP using username and password. So in this case, the IDP cannot satisfy the request. So it throws an error. It says, well, 
you request an MFA. My active session didn't authentic, or the user didn't authenticate with MFA for the active session. So what it's going to do now is, well, it used to fail, but now it's going to respond with the continue on request. So it's now going to say, I need further user interaction. I need to do step up authentication, if you like. So it's actually going to or recreate, oh, sorry, recreate. It's going to actually copy over the auth authentication request it received and put it into a response, uh, base64 encoded and deflated, put it into a, a response, uh, which is part of this continuation API. So it's going to send that back to FedCM. When FedCM gets that, it's actually going to call the continue on endpoint again in a pop-up window. So now you have in, in the ability to interact with the user. And at this point, at the continuation API, the um, IDP will say, oh, this is the authentication request. You requested multi-factor. I can now interact with the user. So I'm going to actually force the user to do multi, uh, second factor authentication. In this case, it's with Duo, but it could be others. And it's going to do that via redirects, OK? So it's going to do this in a way that it would do this if it was doing it at the top level. Um, it's just going to do it in a pop-up window. Um, and then it's going to construct a suitable SAML response. And then technically, it has to call another API method, identity provider.resolve, with the actual token in it, the SAML response, sorry, in it, which then returns that token to FedCM. And then FedCM passes that back to the RP. And the RP can then pass that back to the server. It could do like a form post, or it could do it over the Fetch API, whichever way it wants to do it. And then eventually, you have the SAML response at the RP. And obviously, the RP should validate that SAML response in the same way that it should validate all SAML responses. Um, so that is uh, an example of um, that. These other ones are a little bit quicker because I realize I just keep on talking. But uh, so this is what happens if you don't need to sign in in the first case. So now you're just going to go and say, I want to log in with JISC. You've already got that active session with the IDP. It's suitable for um, the request made by the RP. And so obviously, this is a simpler flow. Uh, so I'm just going to show that. The next one, which is very important to us in, again, in RNE, but probably wider, is this idea of chained authentication. FedCM assumes three parties, a user, a single IDP, and a single RP. And the RP makes a single hop to the IDP to authenticate the user. In RNE and maybe beyond, um, there could be more than that. There could be a number of different parties involved. The IDP could act as an RP to another upstream or downstream IDP. So your IDP may be proxy into another IDP, which is your actual authenticating authority. FedCM doesn't directly support this model, but again, using the login URL and the continue on kind of experimental features, I've tried to kind of see how that would look. Now, there's a caveat to it, perhaps, which I'll come back to right at the end, but let's just see what that looks like um, much quicker than I did before. So I'm just going to select JISC again in this case. And now when I hit login, it's now going to go to the IDP, my FedCM JISC IDP. The yeah, FedCM JISC IDP is actually going to make a NoIDC redirect uh, using the auth code grant to Microsoft. Then I'm going to log into Microsoft. Microsoft is going to respond to my JISC IDP. So that JISC IDP is going to create me a session. And then FedCM is going to call the account endpoint again. And it's going to say, oh, you've got a session with the IDP. And so it's going to send me eventually a mint me a token and send me a response. The last one I wanted to show. Um, was what happens if the IDP is not actually responsible for the user session. So in this case, it's a chained authentication where I want to send the request to the JISC IDP, but the JISC IDP, oh, sorry, the JISC IDP wants to kind of proxy that onto Microsoft Entra. Entra, we would, we would want to be responsible for your session um, rather than the IDP, rather than the JISC IDP. So the JISC IDP isn't doing the session handling at all. It just wants to delegate that to Entra. So I'm just going to see how that looks. So in this case, I'm going to sign in with the JISC IDP. Um, so it's going to go to Entra. I'm going to sign into Entra. It's going to come back to the JISC IDP. The JISC IDP, however, is not going to create me a session. The session is now uh, handled by Microsoft on its own, not by the IDP. But of course, FedCM is now going to make another call to the account send point. The account endpoint is only one hop. So it goes to the JISC IDP. The JISC IDP says, I don't have a session for this user. So it says, continue on. You know, sorry, it says, log in again. So then it goes to log in again. Then it goes back to Entra. Entra has already got your session, so you log in. But that comes back to the JISC IDP. The JISC IDP signals back to FedCM. FedCM goes back to the account endpoint. And then it responds with, I still don't have any accounts because I don't manage your session. And so you get into this kind of loop, this kind of cycle where you just keep trying to um, 
logging forever if you like uh the passkey one was just because i got really excited and decided i was going to put passkeys into this but we don't have time so i will um just going to share some of the points at the end i know i'm rambling a little bit this is exactly what i've just said all the way down to some issues so some of the issues around this uh, the login URL and the continue on URL and these endpoints are presenting these pop-up windows. There doesn't seem to be any restrictions on the HTTP redirects that I can perform in those windows, which kind of makes sense. However, this is a bit contradictory to some extent in that the initial RP and IP, IDP sorry, interaction has to be consented to by the user. So at some, this seems a little bit inconsistent. So at some point, would there be restrictions on what these pop-up windows can do? Um, you know, at the moment, all the chaining that happens beyond the first IDP, so beyond the JISC IDP, is happening in the standard way, just inside Windows. Um, and those other IDPs aren't Fed CM aware or compatible. They just happen to be working because they speak in OIDC or they speak in SAML. Um, it just seems a little bit contradictory. I mean, those are conversations that need to be had. Uh, so I wouldn't guarantee that we could do this sort of multi-hop in the way that I've done, and it still has this problem with the accounts endpoint and things like that. So that's uh, that's something that needs to be thought about and worked on. Um, the widget mode, uh, again, is the only place for multi-IDP support, but at the moment we're doing that in a different way because you can't necessarily sign in with a IDP that you, or sorry, you can't initiate authentication to an IDP you haven't said you've already logged into. So um, that's something that needs to be worked on as well. The user experience is a little bit convoluted. In the past, we used to go to a protected resource that formed a request to the IDP. You did a full page redirect back to the IDP, you authenticated, and then you did a redirect back to the SP or a post back to the SP and there was the resource and you can see it now with pop-ups. There's a pop-up for your initial login. There may be another pop-up for um, a step-up authentication. Um, you know, this is all being worked on. It's not a criticism as such. It's just, you know, uh, uh, an observation of this is a much different user experience than it um, currently is. Um, the, like I say, the IP, IDP needs to be authoritative for the sessions. Otherwise, otherwise we get into these loops. Uh, big changes to infrastructure. You know, we've got Edugain, we've got over 9,000 IDPs and RPs. Um, these are kind of large scale or at least large scale to us federations. We have plenty of IDPs on old software. We have plenty of RPs and probably old software. Um, communication between all of these IDPs and RPs is, is very difficult to do. Um, and so we would need, you know, if we were going to change to something like this, um, we would need to uh, manage that change. It'd be very difficult. Uh, and of course, the ETLD plus one for the well-known file is, is very much an issue. It'd be hard to manage. Um, and you know how, who owns that kind of um, record of where the IDPs are and the config files are for that. And I know there's other people who have opinions. I know I'm rushing a little bit. And the other final thing to note is obviously this is to do with third-party cookie deprecation. Um, we don't actually necessarily have much of a problem with third-party cookie deprecation. So nobody would do what I've just done unless at some point we get you know clobbered by other types of privacy changes in browsers, such as navigational tracking, bounce tracking mitigations. If that doesn't happen, then really we continue with our top level redirects and we are very happy in that sense. Um, if that does happen or if there's a shift, then this is about what does the future possibly look like if we have to do it um, in this way. Uh, so I'm going to stop it there and because I've you know, probably gone over time, uh, I'll let Aaron do um, his demo and then I guess there'll be questions at the end if we need to do it. Apologies to be rushed as well. The slides and stuff will be available on the video. So thanks. You did great, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. There are a uh, uh there is a question in the chat. You think we have time for that one real quick? Um, uh, yeah. Priya asks, yeah. how would these flows uh work with uh, these flows with pop-up windows work in mobile user login journeys? Ah, yes. Um uh, that would be a tough sell. Uh, I don't know. I've not tried it in terms of being on a mobile platform. Um, I think not great, but I would have to, you know, I don't have experience. So Understood. Thanks. All right. Um, switching over to Aaron. Aaron, take it away. Great. All right. So <clears throat> I am going to share a different version of of this for a very different use case. Um, what I want to first do is talk a little bit about the the use case and uh, show what it looks like without without FedCM to then show what adding FedCM will do 
uh, to this is this ecosystem. So um, the experiment I've done here is uh, all under the premise of users uh, using their own websites to log into other websites. So I have a blog, it's Um, I can use that website to log into other things, whether that's services that I use with my blog or just a, a website that I want to go visit. Um, WebEngine.io, this is just a, this is a real, a real website that I run. Um, it actually is all about collecting comments for blogs. Um, I, this is part of the demo because this was the most useful thing I could think of to actually ship this live for people to use. And this is actually, this is all live actually up on, uh, if you, if you download Chrome Canary and turn all the experimental flags that you can get this to work. Um, but I'm going to first show you what this, what this looks like without FedCM to show you the current state of the world. Um, I want to log into this with my blog. I type in my website here and I click sign in. Um, this is going to do a OAuth flow over to my website. You might recognize some of the parameters in the address bar, typical OAuth. Um, there is one additional parameter, which is this extension that makes us work with um, with personal websites, which is, uh, which is that. I have a consent screen on my website. I'm already logged into my website because uh, I typically am all the time. Uh, I have this consent screen. I click sign in and I get redirected back, complete the OAuth flow and logged in. Great. Um, this is again, if if we are if we're assuming that eventually navigational uh, and bounce tracking is going to start getting blocked, this would start getting blocked as well because essentially it's that it's that redirect across a few different domains to make that work. Um, but the other thing about this is that entering entering an address here is not the best user experience. Uh, even entering an email address is not the best user experience. It'd be nice if we didn't have to do that. So. Uh, with that as the premise, let me go over to Chrome Canary and show what this looks like uh, here. So I am using a um, experimental feature in in uh, FedCM, which is called IDP registration. This is uh, something that actually makes this work in this completely open web uh, scenario. So the First thing I have to do before I go log into any website is get my website registered as an IDP in the browser. What that means is that um, what I, one of the differences between uh, the the relationship between the parties in in this kind of uh, world where we have you know this website and I'm trying to get, I, I as a user I enter my my address here. That means this website has no prior relationship with the IDP that's being used to sign in. There's no prior registration of the client. There's no, it has no knowledge of anything. It all gets discovered and on the fly as soon as the user enters their website. So with FedCM, without the IDP registration feature, it doesn't really work because the website has to say, hey, what IDP are we going to use? And then go use it. So IDP, reg IDP registration makes, makes it so that, that uh, the browser actually knows which IDPs are used as identity providers by this browser. Um, so the uh, the first thing I'm going to do as a user is I have to sort of set my website up, and um, this would be in, in in an admin screen somewhere in in you know your website, whether it's WordPress or whatever. But I um, I'm going to click this button, register IDP, and we get this pop up from the browser saying. My website wants to use my account to log into other websites. Great. I'll click allow. That is the registration feature. And uh, now this browser knows that that is my IDP. So now when I go to webmention.io and uh, just visit the home page, I'm using the uh, widget mode of FedCM. And you can see in the corner, it's already brought in the uh, the FedCM dialog up here, and it knows about my IDP. And I can just go ahead and click that. It's doing the handshake behind the scenes, and I'm signed in. I didn't have to type anything because the browser remembers it. Uh, so, and I can go sign up. Here it is again. Um, notice that it's, you know, it's got my actual, my website here. It's got, there's no, like, centralized party in the way. It's just this website asks the browser, what 
who are the, uh, you know, what are the accounts available in this browser? And then uh, it shows it in this list and I can click continue and then, then it finishes the handshake. Uh, behind the scenes, what's going on is, um, Phil already went through most of the FedCM mechanics, so I'm not gonna uh, go over all of that again. But what I do wanna show is the, um, the JavaScript code that this RP is actually running which is the the difference here? Um, this is there's there's two unique things here. One is uh, this config URL any. So in in traditional FedCM, the RP would say this is the IDP or set of IDPs that I expect to have a user log in through. And in this mode, config URL any, the RP is saying I don't care what the IDP is. Any any IDP works. Um, we did have a very good discussion on the GitHub uh, thread and in GitHub issues for FedCM about, about this scenario uh, and ended up adding this new experimental parameter to the spec, which is that uh, allows a RP and IDP to coordinate on this string to match types because it's actually not very realistic that literally any IDP will work. It's actually more like these are sort of bubbles or ecosystems of IDPs that understand uh, a typical, uh, uh, some way of finishing an OAuth flow or sample flow. So IndieAuth is the uh, OAuth extension that adds in this um, like user identifiers or URLs, client identifiers or URLs, that kind of thing. Um, the the uh, unregistered client problem, again, I mentioned that WebEngine.io has no prior relationship with Amprecky.com when I go to sign in, so uh, it needs a client ID of some sort. Uh, client ID as a URL is uh, something that, that IndieAuth describes, but a few other specs and communities have done something similar, and we are able to sort of fit that into FedCM very nicely, uh, which is, uh, this is this is what it looks like. So the client ID that it uses in the OAuth flow is webmention.io slash ID. This can be any URL, it doesn't have to be a slash ID. It can be whatever you want, it's just a URL. Um, and this has metadata doc, metadata about the client. Uh, so this is like the client name, the, the logo URL, redirect URLs that are allowed. Um, basically anything, anything you could put in dynamic client registration can go into this document. Um, side note, this is a, uh, I wrote this up as a um, extension for OAuth. And I have time on the next uh, meet, OAuth working group meeting in a couple of weeks to actually present this as its own building block for uh, for this use or other communities as well who might be doing something similar. Um, so that's the client ID. Uh, one thing I have not done yet is update my implementation with the new params feature. I think Phil did show a bit of that, uh, being able to pass custom parameters into the the, the flow which will be great because um, I did add Pixie here uh, to because it 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 is a, a necessary security feature here. Um, and I had to kind of shoehorn it into the old nonce parameter, which is going to go away uh, in favor of params. So that'll be nicer. And that also means I have the ability to add other parameters into that that might be necessary. Or if you are doing other OAuth or OpenID Connect flows, you could add other things into there as well. Um, so that's the sort of unique bit about this version of using of using FedCM. Um, one of the other parts of this that is uh, different than maybe the the typical FedCM flow is, um, I decided that for for OAuth in particular, but also it does make sense in Open OpenID as well. Um, it is actually nicer to if you have a backend server that you're using for for your RP which this is a server side application so there's a backend server it's actually nicer to have less of the tokens and credentials and stuff flowing through the browser at all in the first place and moving more of it server side as much server side as you can so for this version as well as for a generic OAuth flow over FedCM um of even if it's just uh, tied to a single IDP, I would actually recommend doing this this version of it, which is you might notice that um, I, I I wish I had a slide that descri described this better, but the um, the 
response that uh, that FedCM sends back in the JavaScript, it's this identity credential. Um, and right now the response is called identity credential dot token. Um, and in like Google's FedCM, that is an ID token. Uh, there are no ID tokens in IndieAuth, and there's also no ID tokens in plain OAuth. Uh, there's access tokens. So I didn't want to return an access token here because there's no way to know in this layer that it's real or or valid, uh, which you, you do get if it's an ID token because you can validate the signature. So instead, this is not a token at all. This is, in fact, an OAuth authorization code. And it's an OAuth authorization code, which the client can use to exchange for tokens. And this gets back to this idea of if you have a server-side application, ideally, the access token would never even touch the browser at all. So what in the browser layer, which is this JavaScript file, the browser gets this authorization code back from the FedCM API. It's going to go and send it up to its backend server, sending that authorization code which the backend server can then exchange for whatever tokens it needs. Um, so that is the um, version of, that's the recommendation I would actually have for, for using FedCM with any kind of OAuth flow. Uh, and then you just avoid any access tokens going through the browser at all. Um, the So yeah, so that ends up working great uh, for webmention.io as well. It means that the server-side code here can go and fetch the user's profile information. Um, if we did need an access token for things, it could get that as well. Um, so the, I think, I think that's about it uh, for this. The, yeah, it's the, um, the summary is the, Browser is the one that's actually mediating this. This uh, the only thing that knows about my my IDP here, and it's a it's kind of like acting as a auto autofill almost for for this, um, except it's actually also negotiating the credentials instead of just literally autofilling the address here, which is which makes it even better. Um, if I was not logged in to my website, this wouldn't pop up right now. So I don't, I would have to, um, I would expect to go through the button mode version of the flow. Uh, in that case, I just haven't developed that. Um, so far for me, like this is actually working out great because, and and I suspect for most people it would work out uh, fine because in this deployment, you're typically always logged into your website as you're going around anyway, so it's fine. Uh, but I would expect that um, eventually to change this prompt entirely, to a FedCM button that launches FedCM in button mode, which then does give you the ability to, to log into your IDP. Um, there's a couple of other edge cases around that, as I'm sure you can start imagining of different login states and what happens when there's no IDP registered, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some issues on GitHub, on the GitHub repo that are tracking that right now as well. So um, we're trying to, trying to work through all that. Um, so yeah. That's the that's that's the demo. Um, like any good login demo, uh, it's pretty fast and things just work and you don't really see anything happen. So, <laughs> ta-da! <laughs> Excellent. So while you were chatting about the um, the uh, tokens, Brian Campbell asked, "What about WS Federation?" I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Do we have any other questions folks want to ask? Yes. Um, Dennis, go I, ahead. Um, so I'm not by any stretch a FedCM expert, et cetera. So I'm uh, by observation of what Phil presented versus Aaron, trying to address this whole problem of how to get the list of my IDPs within a federation of 6,000 IDPs. Aaron presented a registration capability. If we presented something of a my IDPs as a federation service, 
of so so I can go and say, oh, here's the six thousand IDPs within the federation, and I just register the IDPs that I care about within FedCM. Is that does that any of that make sense? Does, does that address mm -hmm. what Phil was kind of getting at? Yeah, I think uh, so. Obviously, initially this didn't exist, so this idea of listing six seven thousand on that drop down or widget uh, mode uh, display was not going to happen. Uh, if you only, you know, in reality, you have a perhaps a few IDPs that you only um, the only use, so you only register, um, and then another extension of that maybe that uh, you could preload that into browsers in kind of enterprise environments and say this is the IDP for this university or this is the IDP for this other university, and then that makes the problem much easier um, to realize, I guess, in either of those uh, UI modes. Um, you have to be at the origin, obviously, of the IDP to register it. Um, so Seamless, I know the Seamless Access people looked at, um, if you go to Seamless Access, uh, which is its own origin, and you want to register an IDP, that would be great, but it can't do it because you need to obviously the security model is that you have to be on the origin of the IDP. So um, I think there is something in the registration API, but um, yeah, you know, I have haven't uh, I haven't fully really explored that as an option for disco, you know, for uh, IDP selection. There was something that you just said that really concerns me, the preloading into the browser. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that necessary? Can't we do something more dynamic? Uh it's possible. I mean, I'm thinking of if you're in um like a managed environment, say in a university and you have all your university students and you could preload into their browser that their IDP is a university IDP, then it stops them from having to have some bootstrapping step which says go to this origin and accept that this IDP is um your um you know, you consent to this IDP because they might not even know what that consent is for, whereas if it's managed, maybe that could be helpful. Um I'm not saying yeah, that's the answer. I've... Yeah. I've been thinking about the similar thing in the for the enterprise use case where um, we have the same same situation of there's you know a, a SaaS app that is going to do an enterprise federation and they might have six thousand enterprise customers and that list of IDPs is arbitrary and arbitrarily long and different for every app so there is no it's not even a federation of it's not even a, gr a single grouping of IDPs it's an arbitrary list. Um, so I was thinking about the same thing of we can use IDP registration to solve that. Uh, and in the enterprise scenario, uh, you can also, if it's a managed browser, preload that registration into the browser. And that would save the step of the user having to click that that button to register the IDP. Yeah, I, I, know, I know there's environments where there's these managed browsers, but universities, um, the managed browsers is a rare thing. So yeah, going. and like I showed in my in my demo, the uh, it just it's a step the user has to take at some point to click the button to register the IDP, uh, which is not a huge a huge deal. It just, they just have to know to do that step, and then the browser is able to remember uh, that IDP. Und understood. What I'm kind of getting at is a university or a federation has a my IDP service that you go and visit. It has all the IDPs in it that you could get access to, and then you mm -hmm. would. Red, you know, select the ones that you want to register mm -hmm. and go through the process of registering them. Yeah. And yeah, I think that that would that would be certainly a sensible um, flow for a user to go through. Yeah, and then you would have that, so it would simplify this problem quite uh, uh, significantly. Yeah, and then and then for folks like me, uh, you know, national lab where the world I have to deal with, um, I I can easily, you know, arrange for collaborations of arbitrary IDPs. Yeah. Oh, and as uh, I should say, as Judith has pointed out in the um, in the chat, that's going to be a more difficult problem if you have multiple hops. So you have to potentially register um, all of the different uh, intermediaries, or you know that you might not know about. I mean, that would be something that a typical user wouldn't care about. Um, so it would be more difficult in that environment. But um, so, but there is something I think worth exploring in that uh, registration step. Yeah. I know the seamless access people looking at it or looked at it. So I think they look to see how useful that would be. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Hal. One thing um, that I keep in mind in all of this, or at least try to, is there's not going to be one one single solution that fits every use case just because enterprise, healthcare, higher ed, fintech, they are they're all so different and have such different requirements and yet 
the the commonality here is using a browser to get to all of the above. So I think we're going to see lots of different options that people will have to, the implementers will have to decide what they're going to do. And we don't actually know what all the options are yet. We haven't figured it out. Do we have uh, any other questions? Okay, hearing none. Thank you all very much for coming. Aaron, Phil, you guys were amazing, as always. <laughs> the, the I think folks learned a lot from that, and it was definitely helpful. Um, I will go. I will make sure that these uh, recordings are posted as soon as I get them downloaded and cleaned up. And with that, I will let you all get back to your day. Uh, if you're interested in uh, helping with any of this incubation work, you're strongly encouraged to join the W3C's Federated Identity Community Group, working group if you can. Uh, and also join ID Pro if you want to have a little bit more casual awareness of what's going on there or elsewhere in the space. With that, again, thank you all very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.